and hence the lipids, and hence what we call membranes. For the first three billion years, there's no evidence in the fossil record of any intracellular detail. At the beginning of the Cambrian explosion, you begin to see intracellular detail. And here's an example of this, the microcotton here, uh, you can see the reticular endothelial system. These are all built on lipid membranes. Now, much of the textbooks that you read just talk about lipids as being barriers between one thing and another. It's nothing to do with barriers. It's to do with containing the proteins, lipid bound proteins that are signalers, transporters, and, and, and specialization of uh, inter interacting with the environment. It all happens at the level of the membrane. And the mitochondria, the uh, oxidative process is, is organized all the way down these different prime electricity to, to form to produce the oxygen, uh, oxidative metabolism and the energy that begins to do things. So in effect, the lipids enable intracellular specialization. Mitochondria, nuclear envelope, the reticular endothelial system, and the plasma membrane. So it also enabled, when you look at the evidence, cell specialization. So that clearly led to speciation because the lipids are responsive to environmental differences, temperature and pressure and so on, whereas the protein and DNA are not, and don't forget, the protein and DNA had three, three billion years of time to actually come up with some answers, and all it did was just to produce the prokaryotes and uh, didn't do much else. Uh, a very key component of that, 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 that explosion was the development of the focus bar. This is the um, uh, uh, diagonality which has the focus bar, which is soaking in because of hexanoic acid. And what happened at that time was that the, instead of turning photons into carbohydrates and proteins, it turned photons into electricity. That sparked the evolution of the nervous system, and that eventually led to the evolution of the brain. So look at the chemistry of the photoreceptor, and you see that the, the blue chart is showing that it actually contains more than 50% of protohexanoic acid. It, there isn't actually room to get any more in there. And look at the blue, the green one, that's what's in hot muscle. Now people talk about fish oils today, the fish oils are triglycerides, they're not the stuff that you build cells with, it's the phospholipids that you build cells with. And when you look at the phospholipids of the muscle, it's a different story completely to this kind of fish oil stuff that people are talking about, because it's actually very close to the chemistry that's required for the photoreceptor and for the synapses. So this is what we've got throughout the evolutionary period, right from the beginning of the time of tragedy, all the way through 600 million years of animal evolution, the chemistry of the photoreceptor, the synapse of the neuron, as far as we know, is identical, unchanged for 600 million years. This is, to me, the most compelling evidence for the absolute requirement of DHA. Now, let's look at this in the perspective of human evolution. If you look at this picture, look at the size of the child's hand and the mother's hand. And then look at the size of the brain case of the child compared to the brain case of the mother. What you see is that the physiological priority of whole samples is the brain. It's not muscle and protein, it's the brain and it's lipid. And we need a complete change of paradigm in the nutritional scene to serve that interest. And the second point about this is it's the mother. Because the brain develops before birth. So the priority in terms of biological development of a new child is in fact the mother and the requirements for the brain. Now here's an example of why I think protein is a little grumpy. This animal achieved a one-ton body weight after four years of physical growth. One ton is later to get one after four years. Yes, all the protein it needs for the citrus food, namely drugs. So there we are. Because um, it doesn't make a, 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 a brain. Um, so how do we get from that chimpanzee to where we are today? Well, they talk about throwing spears, to standing up to throw spears to kill that. But you don't stand up, you crawl if you want to hunt animals. And I took that photograph very close to the event, only by crawling close to them. That was the city of Serbia. That was the city of Serbia. You look at the chemistry of the savannas, which is the current crop. The chemistry of the animals that people were eating if they ate them at all, 
really didn't provide any prosthetics to those passengers because that pointed out that long, 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 long process of building. They can't make it from the parent. It blocks of alpha and alanic acid, but very different to prosthetics to those passengers. So uh, it really was uh, the environment was not a nutritional environment that was going to favor the brain growth. And the evidence is here when you look at the brain body weight ratio of all sorts of different animals, there's a lot of rhythmic fall off as you go from the small mammals up to the big ones. It just simply doesn't work. There's no example whatsoever of any parallel evolution of the brain on the surface. So that hypothesis is really out of the window. If you look at the inside the head of the rhinoceros, you can have trouble looking for where the brain is. That's all there is in that huge animal that gets all the posing it needs from the grass. Put Homo sapiens back in that picture, and you see we didn't actually ignore a whole the big brain at all. What we did was to find an ecological niche which enabled us to maintain the harmony of growth of body and brain. A harmony of growth of body and brain. Now where would that be? And the dolphin is the giveaway. It is the only, well, the brain mammals are the only parallel examples of, of extensive brain growth in the past. And they have a problem because they can't get much that goes in hexanoic acid. And if you look at the chemistry of the dolphin compared to the chemistry of a land-based mammal, you see the liver of the dolphin has plenty of the golden hexanoic acid, but the um, land-based mammal is negative. So my case rests here that it was impossible for Homo sapiens to evolve on the survival platform. We had to be coastal. We had to be using the marine environment as a major source. Because that's where the brain evolved. Brain evolved, you see, 500 million years ago. What was it using? There was nothing on the land at that time. The only thing we could use was marine nutrients. Come on, guys. So where's where the policy that tells us about this? There isn't there. Well, there's our friend of Dolphin. Dolphin is 1.8 kilograms of brain. And a similar body sized animal on the survival of Africa is only about 300 grams. Uh, it's interesting that the dolphin has all the bones of the human head inside its but that's another story. Well, we have the pleasure of visiting a critical point where um, the there's now incontrovertible evidence in South of Africa to show that the first evidence of Homo sapiens about 160,000 to 200,000 years ago was making incontrovertible use of the marine food web. So, there we are. Then we have uh, Herto in Ethiopia as another example of people 160,000 to 200,000 years ago that were living beside the sea. Um, now, to compare that with Hyderbergensis, you know where Hyderberg is, it's far removed from the sea. Um, that fellow didn't eat any fish, that one did. So there's another example. And of course we've got Chris Trainer showing that Homo sapiens <coughs> not made the planet by my mating ground, the coast virus. Now we've got the crunch evidence for this, is that David Attenberg, in the Scars of Evolution, a BBC program, at the end of discussing all this, and the why, why, and why not, at the end of it, he said, I wonder if land animals were born like humans with a layer of fur. That's the fact he works, he started with the children, babies are born. And nobody could tell him that there was any land based mammal that was born with fur like humans are. But, Maybe he thought marine mammals were. So he asked around, and um, nobody knew about marine mammals being born with fur. And then two weeks before the program came out, a, a professor from the University of British Columbia phoned up and said, Aha, the sea of how the sea was born with the layer of fur. Every time I hand with a pup, you walk pup, my hands come away all covered with wax. So we got um, Tom Brennan, who's a mass spectrometry expert in the United States, working for Hell at the time, to, um, <coughs> to, to, to test whether or not we would expect that human mammals were quite different from land, but marine mammals. Um, so he tested that with his high power mass spectrometry, and there are then three marine mammals, the vernix of three marine mammals 
um, human learning is identical in this chemical composition. I think this is an absolute friendship. And of course, one other thing is, is you know, children are born knowing how to swim. We actually have to learn to walk on that. Um, Philip Tobias, one of the greatest theoretical authors, said these words, we were profoundly and utterly wrong about this survival process. So what's special about the chemical? It's, there's two molecules which have only got one double bond missing. Two hydrogen missing doesn't work. You need all six double bonds. So why the last double bond? And if you look at the, we've done the electrochemical dynamics of the molecule, and you see that if you leave a double bond out, the electrochemistry just simply peters out at the end, either one end or the other. So the hypothesis that we put forward is this, that the fundamental signaling process is controlled by DHA. The, the synapse and the photoreceptor just stop it and stuff. If you have a source to quantum mechanics, you know that if a photon hits the gun or a metal or it can cause the electron to jump out, that's a photoelectric effect. That can say solar effect stuff. Now, if you think of a photon in classical physics as a particle, when it hits the stage two barriers between the double bonds, it can't go through. <clears throat> but in quantum mechanics, you don't have to think about it. There are no barriers. There's, uh, the, in fact, you can think of the electric photon as a wave. And as a wave, you don't know where it starts or ends. So it can actually penetrate the barrier and pop up the other side. Now, if it sees an electron that has the same quantum mechanical properties as itself, it says, well, oh, I can't go there, and it goes back again. But if you take a photon to energize an electron and make it jump out, or put a, uh, a potential difference across the membrane to suck an electron out, then another electron can move in. But it can only move in at the same energy as the one you moved out, the same quantum mechanical properties as the one you moved out. That gives you absolute precision of the signal. You need that for the two photoreceptors, two photoreceptors respond differently to the same wavelength cutting in visions of growth. You have to have actual precision. And there is no thesis in the books at the moment other than this that allows for that absolute precision. So what does nature think about it? Well nature, <coughs> that's the amount of stuff in DHA in the food, and you see it, it each time it crosses a barrier until it gets to the synapse and the photoreceptor, nature actually sucks it out of the system for biomagnification and amplifies it. So we're now looking at this in terms of um, uh, what's happening in pregnancy. Um, we see, uh, we've done a study uh, supplementing mothers with the glucosinogenic acid and the arachidonic acid, and I just want to point out that, that looking at the magnetic resonance images, of babies that are born, we're beginning to see uh, a large proportion of the babies actually with developmental disorders, which are not noticed until very much later. Take white matter also of intensity. That is what you see in the time of ADHD and failure to be. So this is all these kind of behavioral problems are happening in the water. So the mother is the priority again. And when we look at the membrane of the mother when she enters pregnancy, we can find a predictor of preterm births, which is the greatest risk of neurodevelopmental disorder, with a better than 90% confidence level. And that also predicts the status of the type of polyunsaturated fatty acid needed for brain growth is also predicting neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, so we looked at the uh, effect of the supplement during the pregnancy, um, and what we found was that it didn't affect the girls. But the boys, we saw effects in terms of the, um, the cortex, the gray matter, and in particularly the uh, corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is interesting because that's connectivity. It's not neurogenesis. Neurogenesis happens very early. So there was an effect, but it was a minor effect only affected the boys who are much more susceptible to a certain fatty acid deficiency than the girls. So then we have some 
pretty compelling evidence about this story. But let me add one last thing about that particular story. It says, um, the pre predictor is from the membrane of the of mother's tissue at 12 years. The red cell is a half-life of 120 days. That means that it is the condition of the mother in the months prior to conception that actually determines outcome. Now let me repeat that. It's the condition of the mother in the months prior to conception that determines outcome. And it makes such sense. In the Bible tells us that the seed on poor soil doesn't grow very well. You put seed on good soil and it grows beautifully and flourishes and fruits. It's the same principle. At day seven after conception, the seed is implanted in the mother. And it's dependent on the interior area of the mother for what happens after that. Now, evidence, um, epidemiological evidence shows that uh, major depression is adversely related to the DHA indication. And the biggest, longest uh, study of um, you know, mothers during pregnancy that follow up with children from eight years of age to a more as a straight line, depending on the amount of food, sorry, of the seed the mother ate during the pregnancy, a straight line with cognitive development and with a whole bunch of behavioral stories of general type of learning. So I just finally I want to just say what the relevance of this at all is. In 1804, 103 years, we had one billion of population. In the year 2000, it totally took 11 years to add it. We are in trouble. The arable land available for food production is reaching a limit. The marine habitat has also reached a limit, and we're depending on, on, on aquaculture. But aquaculture has now gone down the tubes because they're having to feed it with chicken feathers and all sorts of sources of protein and uh, vegetables. <coughs> it, it, it is a very serious thing. And a lot of problems to do with the pollution. Uh, in in, in Maryland, for example, in 1889, they harvested 616,000 metric tons of oysters, only 12,000 um, uh, uh, 12, in 2002. So what we have here is, if you look at the oyster, it's actually sequestering CO2 because the shell is solid calcium carbonate, hence the hypothesis of dope. Um, so in, back in the last century before last, the oyster harvest was killing 270,000 metric tons of CO2 in this one estuary per year. Now it's not doing that. We need to get back to producing oysters again. That's the largest thing. I mean, that we've just raked the coastline with both population and pollution. Um, when I was a child, uh, we used to go to this wonderful restaurant which had um, seafood. Uh, every time my father wanted to celebrate, and um, I'm coming back from Africa in '65, I said, but let's go down trip down memory lane. Yeah, okay. We went down there <clears throat> and some summer evening looked out at the shore of the great wonderful iron bridge across the first fall, and this is what we saw. Warning. Also unfit for human consumption. <clears throat> we have to sort that. It's the brain involved in the sea, and if we lose our attachments with the marine food web, we have had um, in Indonesia, they're growing kelp, kelp farms, just like pancakes farms, but up and more. We've got to start thinking more like that. And um, Takahiro Tanaka in Japan has created the most wonderful set of um, what I call green agriculture. He calls it green farming, but so there you are. Uh, it does all this sort of stuff, absolutely wonderful. And they have tripled the productivity in this region between the three islands. Um, it's a lot of uh, effort. Maybe just as we have green pastures for cows and sheep, so he has green pastures for fish. You know, we, 10,000 years ago, sitting around the campfire, said this hunting in Canada is perhaps not that good anymore. And so they developed that. 
You don't have to do exactly the same at the same time. And people are doing it. I've got both the Japanese and the company from our internet are doing this in a very serious way. So now what's the problem? Okay, in the European Union they did an analysis of health costs and brain disorders came out top. 386 billion. Oh, new 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 methodologies, you guys. You just tell us how far this. To repeat it, 2010, the bill was 789 billion. So we got people at the, uh, to ask questions, actually, uh, Lord Morris to ask questions at House of, House of Law, and give the Department of Health, they did the numbers. And it came out with 77 billion for the UK for mental illness. 77 billion for cost rate of heart disease and cancer combined. Um, so, repeated. Okay, 2010, 105 billion. 2013, 113 billion. So, that really is a most serious issue. If we lose the brain, we lose everything. And the evidence is that IQ has been falling since 1950. We lose the brain, we lose homo sapiens. It's the sixth extinction, the sixth extinction. So, just to find the fifth end, the supreme importance of nutrition of the mother is, is the key to neurodevelopment, but with the stuff that is needed for the brain and before she can see, even in preparation. That is what happens at 12 weeks after conception. By the time the women come to us at Chelsea and Westminster to report for pregnancy care, the cells that were form the cortex are already on their way to do so. It's too late to worry about pregnancy, although we can do what you can pregnancy and after, but it is before conception that it actually has that response. So, uh, Peggy Wynn gave a wonderful talk to the Carolyn Walker Trust and said, the title was, No Nation Can Rise Above the Health of Its Women. And that's absolutely 100% true. Brain capital and progress demands solutions to the problem of prematurity and low birth rate. It demands solutions to this rise in mental disorders of all kinds. Because it keeps on going like this. It is the end of humanity. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's our children and their children that are at risk. Thank you for listening.